Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we have someone that I have the utmost respect for. When you talk about building something from the bottom all the way through to the top, this man has done it. It is none other than Matt Newby. Uh, he is currently the head coach of the BBL program Worcester Wolves, um, but has, perhaps is more known for his tenure in Leeds, uh, where he built a program literally from the bottom. Uh, we're talking about community sessions through to a senior team, a Division 4 program that got promoted to Division 3, that got promoted to Division 2, that got promoted to Division 1, had won it all, and then ultimately went, went into the, the BBL uh, as a professional franchise and did experience some, experience some success, but ultimately, um, you know, we all know that it, it didn't go as planned, um, was it, as you'll hear in this, an incredibly uh, difficult period um, for, for Matt personally, but also, I guess, everyone that was involved with the program. And so I kind of wanted to get him on to talk about that entire journey, um, talk about kind of what it takes uh, to, 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 to make a club grow uh, to that level from the bottom, um, the challenges that are faced with, the differences between competing in, in National League and the BBL, um, but then also uh, all the stuff around the stuff off the court that, that you know we don't hear about uh, so much um, and uh, primarily the other sort of big angle for me was the university angle I feel like uh, university sport in this country is is obviously not uh, massively prominent and there's an opportunity there uh, and, and newbie is someone that has been involved with um, sort of institutional basketball uh, on the university side the educational side um, over the course of a decade and kind of seen uh, what we describe as kind of its peak and kind of where it is now and and the the scholarships that are on offer at one point what what, what are, what's on offer now and kind of where university basketball uh, has a role to play within the, the greater ecosystem of, of British basketball. So it was a super interesting conversation and one that you know I really appreciate Matt doing um, because he was super open about it uh, and kind of spoke about you know experiences that were incredibly difficult for him. So uh, yeah, maximum respect and I think there will be a lot to uh, glean from, from listening, a lot of learnings. Anyway, before we get into the show, as always, please take two seconds to go and take a look at our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash H-O-O-P-S-F-I-X. There you can start to give us a monthly or annual contribution of as much as or, or little as you like uh, you know when you go into a, a, a supermarket and you buy a sandwich or you go to a coffee shop and you buy a, a cup of coffee you don't even think twice about it and that's what we're asking for from you to help us do this work that i'm assuming you're enjoying because you're listening to um so please go and uh, consider um making a contribution at patreon.com uh, forward slash who's i promise you won't even notice it leaving your account but it makes a big difference to what we're doing um in trying to grow this whole british basketball uh, media landscape thing uh, as always please leave a comment below on youtube if you're watching let me know what you think uh, you can drop me an email uh, personally Sam at hoopsfix.com or you can reach out to me on every single social media platform at hoopsfix I'd love to hear what you think uh, and I think uh, that is uh, enough from me uh, here is this week's show uh, with uh, Worcester Wolves head coach Matt Newby Matt welcome to the show thank you very much thanks for having me Sam so uh, obviously we're what a, a month or so into the season, sort of restarting um, your second season uh, in Worcester. Kind of, I guess, just just starting there. Like this season has been pretty unprecedented um, in terms of what we're trying to deal with and kind of get through it with COVID and everything else. You know, for you personally, you know, how's the season been? Um, how are you finding it? How are the sort of adaptations you have to make, and how do you kind of see it playing out uh, over the rest of the year? So, first of all, I, you know, I think like any coach or any player, we're just glad to be on the floor uh, and glad to be competing. I think the BBL, uh, the respective franchises within within the league and, and, and Basketball England have really dealt with this situation admirably. You know, there's going to be people that criticise every aspect of what we do as a basketball fraternity. But the fact of the matter is um, we're on the floor, we're playing and, and there's a product there. Do you feel uh, your potentially in a better situation than, than other clubs because of the, the, the ties with the university? I think there's some um, huge benefits. Obviously, the University of Worcester partnership is, is um, underpins um, uh, the, the Wolves' um, journey. You know, it's now the 20th year of the organisation. Um, but I think there's obviously certain things that each franchise has to manage and each administration has to manage and... and uh, Again, I can only commend the, the, the backroom staff and, and, and the management in terms of how they're dealing with things. I think, obviously, there are some benefits to having our own uh, arena. There's some benefits to, obviously, the ties in terms of uh, ancillary support, like strength and conditioning and the physiotherapy and sports therapy. So, you know, we're, we've been ticking over nicely. Um, but, you know, there's, there's still the challenges associated with COVID protocols, um, you know, 
getting the streaming service going. The, again, the administration have, have done really, really well with that. And I, and I think every 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 organisation will have their unique problems. Um, so you know, thus far, fingers crossed, we're 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 making headway. Obviously, the the, the Worcester roster this season uh, that you put together. Um, Right now, kind of, how complete is it? Like, we're well aware that you're kind of basically pretty much playing without imports. Um, kind of, what's the situation there, and uh, how, how do you see it panning out over the next few weeks? There's just been some some serious challenges with the administration associated with with visas. Um, is that because of COVID? Uh, it is, and and really, you know, I can't go into too much detail about it, but it's you know we we've just been held up. We there's some of our paperwork that's with the, with the government body, and 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 we're waiting on it. And you know, uh, we've got uh, U.S. based players, um, you know, eager to be on the floor. We're eager to have them, but ultimately we're we're punching without them at this moment in time. And there's some challenges with that. You know, there'll be a physical attrition on the players that we have, but there's some young guys that have been stepping up, and and you know the likes of. Uh, Martin and Jordan have, have showed good stewardship over the younger guys and uh, we obviously uh, added Matthew on a, a short-term basis just to to try and um, help us hold court against uh, the other teams in our in our cup group and for the opening uh, the opening bit of the uh, the championship I was going to say are you surprised uh, with how well you have been competing without your US based guys I mean I, th- I think you know, I, I'll back the guys that I've got. You know, we're, we're organised. Um, the work rate is excellent, and they're a disciplined group. And you know, on the whole, and and although we're young, you know, we're ambitious, and and I think, you know, that was reflected in last year's unit as well. It's probably where I'm most comfortable working with the young and up, upcoming players. And uh, I think for our league, that's actually not a bad model to follow. And uh, you know, you, you get some young, ambitious US imports. You get some young, ambitious. Uh, domestics that have maybe um, got a little bit of a point to prove, and, and you've got a nice recipe for for team chemistry. You've got a nice recipe for culture. You've got a nice recipe for for performance. Obviously, you, you came over to Worcester ahead of last season. Uh, how like how was you you had previous to that you had spent you know pretty much your entire professional career building up what you'd built in, in Leeds, and you all of a sudden in a completely different environment. Um, how did you find that sort of transition and, and how would you say that first what we're going on a year and a half or so that you've been in, in based in Worcester like how, how have you found that sort of transition hey, it was a big decision for me it was a big decision for my family but ultimately I wanted um, an opportunity um, in the professional game again um, you know the the timing seemed to fall in my favour and you know, Worcester is 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 a different animal. Um, it, it's it's constructed a little bit differently to to how Leeds met and Leeds Carnegie and Leeds Beckett kind of became. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know what Mick Donovan and and his staff and and the you know the previous ten years have done with the program is they built they built a powerhouse. You were on the sidelines as they collected all those championships. You know over the years and, and ultimately for whatever reason performance had dipped they were looking for a new look they were looking for a new option um, and I guess my resume kind of fitted because I'd already been in institutional basketball and um, it was just it was just an exciting proposition and, and, and really I have to thank the management they, they gave me carte blanche of recruitment they, they, they've been very very supportive in some of the things that I want to do on the floor and, 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 and how we want to kind of build a program for the future and I'm very fortunate I've got a, a very good assistant in Dean Blake who's who's uh, tried to reinvent the books program as well so those two things are running concurrently and, and and we're working very very hard to to be back up there with the likes of a you know a Loughborough you know like I, I, I may be wrong but uh, I get the impression that at Leeds you were very much uh, doing everything you know you had a lot of different roles and responsibilities across the entire operation uh, and I would guess, may, maybe I'm wrong, that Worcester has a very different infrastructure in the sense that there's probably uh, a lot less responsibilities in terms of breadth across the organisation on your plate. Kind of when you talk about your day-to-day uh, roles and responsibilities, how, how does that compare to kind of the situation you're in in Leeds and kind of what you're what you're in in, Leicester, in Worcester? Sorry. Uh, I mean, you, you're probably right. I think the the, the program in Le- it leads grew at an exponential rate probably for 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 basketball in this country um i was very very keen to try and grow um multiple levels of the program you know have a community look have a 
a performance pathway for youth and, and develop an academy. Um, and sometimes ambition is, is is a great thing, but you've got to be able to back it. And, you know, there was times where obviously th- within that program, I had multiple tenures, essentially, you know, I was I was driving the, the university program and the, the performance arm that was competitive in either the, the National League or otherwise. And then I was on the road with the academy um, and then trying to help um, the community arm ev- evolve in a way, you know, and, and have a, a strong level of grassroots basketball in the um, in, in the city of Leeds itself. So in contrast, I'm, I'm now in a, a position where I'm head coach um but i think i think some of those um roles will re-emerge because um worcester has a genuine aspiration to continue grow to grow other aspects of it and i think again maybe my resume ticks some of those boxes as well but i i hope that i'll be able to help uh, grow resource because what i think one of the one of the biggest issues in british basketball is is developing quality human resource there's not that many roles for for the the additional staff that you need so you when you look at uh, models like Newcastle and Leicester where they've been successful is is generating a workforce that are delivering basketball on those three levels you know community development and performance and and that was always my aspiration at Leeds I think I maybe got caught maybe uh, with too many hats on but that, that ultimately there were some reasons for that and I just wanted to um, fight through it at the time because I'm very passionate about the game and and really wanted um, wanted uh, young people on multiple levels to, to, to experience the sport. When you talk about your first season in Worcester, obviously you can't talk about it without mentioning the cup, <laughs> the cup title. Uh, you know, how big an achievement was that for you when you reflect on kind of the journey? Um, kind of what would you say about it? Uh, I mean, on, on a personal level, it was, it was quite overwhelming because, um, Obviously, I had two years out from the professional game. Uh, it was the first season. There was a lot of expectation in one way. You know, the, the fan base in Worcester is, is huge. Um, their expectation is high. And uh, they were coming off the back of a couple of seasons where where those expectations hadn't been met. For me personally, I had a lot of expectation on myself because people will talk about what you have and you don't have. Um, you know, and it's nice to get a pat on the back for doing well with Leeds, you know, and, and, and so on. But um, there's a bit more uh, resource here. And, and, and with that come, comes a little bit of pressure. And, you know, it, it was a big personal moment for me. My, my daughters and my partner are in the crowd. She's, you know, she's backed me all the way through this through this journey and see me uh, at the very, very highest and the, and the very lowest, of, you know, personally. So, um and, you know, I felt vindicated in a way because um, some people have been discourteous. You know, uh, it's, it's a common trait in the British basketball fraternity. You know, some people have been discourteous about my career, my, about my ability. And I think um, for me, it was it was just getting that off my back, you know. Do you think like when you talk about your sort of basketball achievements, would you put that at the top? It, it, it's a big one because it was so personal to me, I think. Um, you know, like I say, it, it was a moment at which I could kind of look back and think the uh, the journey I'd taken and, and some of the decisions that I'd made um, were valid, um, you know. Um, but honestly, there's there's been a few moments, you know. Um, there's been a f- few pieces of silverware that have been important to me. Um the first national shield in Division Four, um, the the national cup with a very young group. Um, uh, you know when we when we we took Bristol in the fourth quarter on the, on the back of a, a ridiculous run from Henry Wilkinson. Uh, not not just because of the moments, but because of the 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 young men that were on that journey with me, and, and I, can't, I kind of guess what they'd given to me as a coach, and and potentially what that platform meant for them. Um, and then just some of the younger guys, that, and I think most of the guys in the country will say this, those guys that are involved in the academy stuff, you know, the trophies are good, but when a kid goes out to the States and, you know, he's given a $300,000 education and they get the opportunity to um, set themselves up in life, you know, I think that those are important moments as well. So it's hard for me to gauge, honestly, because it, it, 
although it's been like like from 2006, was like 14 years, the pace at which things were happening up until a certain point when there was a, a quite an abrupt stop, you know, it it was it's a bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> Of course, the, the other thing that was interesting about about that final was, of course, your opponent was was Bristol Flyers with Andreas, who, you know, you and him go back way back because of all the battles in in the National League, and obviously their club essentially did what you did with Leeds, coming up from the bottom and working their way up through through all the the competitions, uh, eventually to the to the top flight. You know, ha, ha, did that play in your mind? Did you did that kind of was that something that sort of went into you were thinking about, or was it not not something that factored in at all? I mean, on on game day, you know, um, you know, you you're you're as prepared as you're prepared. I don't I don't think we could have prepared any more. Uh, I think the guys were were motivated and and they gave a very very good defensive performance. You know, and matching up with Andreas was kind of um, it it was a nice a nice thing in terms of it. it things had gone full circle almost because, like you say, there was the the big battles in the national league and um, lower down. And I don't think there's ever been a I don't want to say a bad game, you know. There's always they've always they've always been close on the whole. Um, they've always they were, they've always had critical moments, and you know, he's a tried and tested um, high level coach. You know, he, he's part of the GB program, and the, there's probably a little bit of an intrinsic motivation there in that. You know, it, it's personal. You know, in the right way, it's competitive. It's competitive and it's personal because when you've watched each other's journeys, you kind of want to. It is probably the best measure of, of who I am as, as a coach domestically because the paths have been so similar. So, but yeah, it's personal, but but in the right way, you know, it's it's not not malicious in any way. It's just like this guy's good. I want to I want to beat him. You know. Yeah, of course. With the season, you know, ultimately being cut short, how much of a blow uh, for that uh, of that was was that for you? Like, did you feel? Kind of, you guys were in the mix and had a shot at sort of um, doing some damage as this, as the season was sort of coming to it, coming to a close. I, I mean, I think on, honestly, for for a BBL season, it was probably one of the most exciting in terms of how it could close. You know, there were so many um, different ways it could finish, and and I just I I was in a really good place. I think the players were in a really good place. We were incredibly motivated. I, I don't think. It would have been easy to take the number one spot in the league, but I think to to try and secure that home berth was 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 on the agenda. And then I think come the playoffs, you know, it it, it could have been very exciting. And whether or not we we made it to the O2 or not, um, I believe we could have we, we could have been a contender. And 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 that that's a big deal for me personally because you look at the likes of of Leicester and. Coach Pat Nostro and, and and the likes of the, the London fri- franchise and all that Vince has done it, it it means a lot just to be there with them. Do, does that make sense? Because you know they they've been the front runners, them them and, and the Newcastle Eagles and Sheffield for a, for a time in the mix. You know it, it it is important for me to first and foremost be competitive. But if we can make ourselves a contender each year, then then I guess that's the agenda. You know. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so as always, I love going deeper to the history stuff. Um, so let's let's rewind it uh, right back to the beginning. Uh, I would love to hear kind of like you know, f- funny enough, actually, obviously, I did I did research, uh, and there isn't that many long form interviews with you out there floating around um, to sort of pick at. But yeah, I would love to kind of hear your initial um, start in basketball. What was that that first made you get involved with the game, uh, and, and kind of yeah, what started the actual journey? Okay, so um, as, a, as a young man, I, I, I picked up a basketball at grammar school um, uh, in a, a small North Yorkshire town called Knaresborough. There was a Carnegie graduate called Steve Mirrifield, who was a professional player at the time. He'd um, uh, played for Derby, uh, for Doncaster, Oldham, uh, and up in, up in Newcastle, incidentally. And um, he was a bit of an inspiration to the school, actually. The guy walked in, a big, big physical dude started basketball on a on a on a morning at school and on a lunchtime and um sport was a big deal for me at school because i wasn't having the best time so any anything on a lunchtime or a morning or you know, on a on a on, a, on or post school was was r- really big deal to me so basketball was the, the thing i picked up i i think i was okay you know i i, I probably tried every sport you know you know but basketball was the one that stuck with me and uh I mean, it, like like most people, it's an easy game to 
uh, play by yourself. You can just go shoot on a basket. You know, you can you can rep out. You can match up one on one, two on two, three on three, which you know is one of the things that I think makes the game so special because you can, you can play anywhere. You know, and uh, got involved, and then uh, I, I I didn't do very well in my GCSEs, so my uh, my dad gave me an ultimatum. He gave me uh, one year to sort it out. Um, fortunately, I passed them, and then I went and did a. Uh, uh, one of the first BTECs in sport in, uh, in at Thomas Danby in Leeds. Um, played one year of Junior National League um, because I was too old after that, you know, because I'd, I'd done my reset year. Uh, but but got really heavily involved in coaching early. Um, Thomas Danby gave you this opportunity to do multiple sports. And then you had to go and, you know, to kind of get endorsed on that particular module or that particular credit, you had to go out into the community. So I went and did some work in Hare Hills and Chapel Town. And... Although I continued to play, um, I guess I found the bug for, for teaching or coaching early. And um, I ended up, because <laughs> conversely to my GCSEs, I, I distinctioned my BTEC. And as a reward, uh, three or four um, members of, of our group, got uh, our BTEC group, got uh, sent out to Sweden for, for a month. So uh, we went out um, and we taught and coached. And I, I, I was teaching in the day at high school and coaching with... Uh, a club in Uribru on, on an evening just getting to, to know the game and just really soaking up the experience culturally and otherwise came back went to America uh, just as a generic counsellor but got involved with the basketball program there and then um, made some decisions about university and uh, I'd, I'd applied to Loughborough Brighton was there were big physical education institutions at the time but when I got, got down to the interview in Brighton the campus was in Eastbourne and I don't know if you've ever been to Eastbourne, but it's East, pretty- Eastbourne is my hometown. Is it? Really? Yeah, yeah. It's God's waiting room. <laughs> it's, it's, it was a little quiet, so I don't want to be discouraged. No, no, be as disrespectful as you want, man. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I walked down the high street, and it seemed like every other shop was a funeral home, and the average age of a girl there was, I think, about 70. So I, 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 I just didn't feel it. So I, I decided to go through clearing, and I had the opportunity to either stay at home, go to Leeds Carnegie, or uh, go away to... Um, uh, I ended up randomly in Preston because uh, there was a, a last minute sports science course there and I kind of exhausted some of the options um, and it was a generic sports science degree uh, pretty pretty boring um, to be honest I wasn't enjoying it but I would got involved with the sports development unit there, and they topped up all my qualifications and I got involved in developing basketball in that town and um, we launched a program called Preston Pride um, so this is all whilst you were at university still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, to be honest, I, I, it was it was a bit of a mad one really because I, I, I just the, the basketball was keeping me going because I, I wasn't actually enjoying that particular university. Um, I probably enjoyed the nightlife a little bit, but that, you know, in terms of the actual what the return I felt I was getting from the course, all of the return the course was getting from me wasn't good. But through the sports development unit, I met um, a guy called Hamish Telfer, who was at St. Martin's on the coaching degree there. And basically, I spent spent this first year at UCLan, didn't really enjoy it, was was going to reset the year, got through it, um, enjoyed the basketball side of things, went on a tour to the Ukraine, played played a little bit. But this, this guy was like, no, you want to coach, you want to get involved in coaching, come and do this degree. So, I, and I basically... Got, got all my quals topped up at, in the sports development unit, but then moved up to Lancaster and um, continued to coach in Preston. Uh, we produced a couple of uh, national team kids. One of note is probably Ben Eves, um, uh, who ultimately transferred to Manchester. But, but went to ta- UConn, right? Yeah, he went to UConn and then yeah. uh, um, moved on to Rhode Island. But, um, you know, that experience was 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 good for me because I was coaching junior national league in the northwest. It was very very strong. So the likes of Jeff Watson, Joe Forber, uh, Roy Blake, Mal Cassin, Mike Burton. They're all these stalwarts of the of the British basketball community, and they were we were, were, all, were all actively coaching at the time. So I was kind of this young guy coaching against all these old phys- older sorry not old older physical educators, and and that was really cool. Like I mean the t- the, the northwest was banging for for talent you know uh, manchester manchester tended to uh, attract the kids after a certain point but that was natural the best kids wanted to play with the best kids um but that was a good experience for me um 
with with Ben having the success he did, I, I ended up working with the um, at the time this uh, the under 14s development squad, which was run by Bob McFadden, and they did this massive trial down at Cannons in Leicester, and there was just so, some of the talent that, that was there was unbelievable. It was Paul Guade was there, you know, there was there was there was, there was Clay Fell Harris was a, a youngster then. This was England under 14s. England under 14s, yeah, back in the day. So I was like this like volunteer assistant basically and I got to go to Amiens in France with them and uh, that was a, kind of my first taste of something a bit more um, and then I think things kind of rolled on um, completed my degree again some tough times in my degree but basketball was always the kind of vehicle and actually the coaching was always the vehicle to kind of keep moving and when I graduated um, I basically had written a couple of emails to um, some camps in the States and uh, I went to the Philadelphia 76ers camp first, which which turned out to be quite. It, it sounds impressive, but it was quite. It was it was a generic basketball camp, really. Uh, the 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 talent was sometimes good and sometimes wasn't. But the um, the director of the camp was like, "You're a good coach. You know, you, you what you need to do is you you need to be with me for four weeks. You'll be you can be my assistant director, but then you need to go to Five Star or the Hoop Group and and actually get your fix in terms of." performance so this I'd gone, gone and done the first year then wrote my letters again and I ended up going to five star and the Pocono Invitational and ultimately the Eastern Invitational and beginning to network with these like powerhouse organizations at the time because the camp scene in the states was was massive and five star was well it's legendary you know so I'm there then going out each summer um so you went out every every summer for what how, how many years 15 10 15 years um, maybe not 10, 15, I think eight to 10. And then, and then we, we bought five star here, but I mean, it, it was just, it was, I was a bit of a, a junkie, you know, a, a bit of a geek and, and I mean, the camps aren't easy, you know, you, 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 it is it, at the time it was a week long, you're up at seven in the morning, you coach until 10 at night, you do stations in the morning, games in the afternoons. But one of the highlights was they'd have these these lectures and, and they bring in some big hitters. So you like you, you'd get to see John Calipari talk, Dave Odom talk. I wasn't there when Shashevsky talked, but then an, an NBA player would come in like Vince Carter, you know. And 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 every, every week there was this kind of golden opportunity for an hour and a half just to listen, learn, and and contemplate what it actually takes and what it actually means to coach and and what it what it means to do it at that level and. And that was amazing to me. But and uh, that that fraternity, that fraternity was unbelievable. You know, everybody was experiencing the same thing. There are hard days, but you know, when you're on stations, you'd flip flop. So you'd you'd be working with one coach, you'd see how he'd work, then you'd work with another coach on another station, and and you're kind of just absorbing all this information or sharing information, you know. Um, and those those experiences probably gave me a, a head start in terms of, uh, I guess, my own ideology, my my own understanding of the game, technical development, and otherwise. Were you paying Were you paying for your own flights to get out there every summer? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I was I was bas- basically. You, I mean, to be fair, flights weren't that expensive, but I mean, the first checks I took for the first two years for for a week were like one hundred and seventy five dollars. <laughs> like, and you know, it, you 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 needed some respite at the end of the week, so uh, sixty would go at the bar when you're talking uh, talking shop. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so um, and a, and another fifty would go on just just some nice food because <laughs> yeah, camp, yeah. camp food traditionally, wherever you go in the world, camp food's not good. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, I paid my own way, but I think it I think it was important to do so and and I think it like I say, it kind of formed a lot of my opinion on, on, on coaching and and I, I guess I was very Western centric, you know, in in that period. How how much uh, like when you sort of contrast your coaching development in the UK compared to what you were getting in the States when you when you talk about kind of I guess the differences like what were you getting every summer in the US that that maybe you weren't getting in the UK? I mean I, I, I I'm not I'm not blaming anyone. I, one I'm I'm quite a little bit of a loner, so I you know I, I I'm quite independent. I wanna I wanna do my own thing, um and I and I didn't, I didn't want to fake it. You know I mean there's a lot of people that walk around our fraternity and you know. 
for me, they they haven't done enough for for the station that the station that they hold, and I never wanted to be in that position. I, what I always wanted to, to be credible and authentic, and 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 that that's not me being again disrespectful or discourteous to anyone. The people that I could probably learn from in in my early a sorry sorry in my early years were the likes of Joe Forber was amazing, amazing how how, how he built his program and how he developed in it players. You know, um, like say those those guys in the northwest, they really knew how to coach, but they were all physical educators, so they'd all been through the process of developing uh, their teaching, um, understanding young people. And they were really, really high level. There was Dave Ransom in Sheffield as well at, at, at the time. And I'd, I'd, I'd fortunately, uh, you know, uh, got involved with, with a few things in the UK. The, the best things that I went to in the UK were the, the BCA Nike clinics. That, that John Collins and Mark Dunning and the like were, were, were running. They they would bring bring in guys that could really really coach. They could really really teach. They could really really inform you. But I just I just wanted a little bit more, you know. And um, I think Laszlo Nemeth was was amazing. Um, and it, you know that Eastern influence was always a you know an interest to me. But I I, I don't think there was enough. I, I I know I know that sounds a bit harsh. I I, I, I just don't think there was enough available at, at the time. The B, the BCA were trying very very hard to create uh, to try and create a culture of sharing information, uh, building a fraternity and otherwise. And, and I think that was going in the right direction. But, you know, one, one week, one week at Five Star or the, or, or the Hoop group was very intensive. You had to be able to teach and coach because you were on the floor all the time. And, and I think I, and maybe I got addicted. I don't know. When you compare kind of the situation back then for for young coaches coming up now, like how, how would you compare the two? Do you think young coaches have got more resource available to them now to improve and get better? I, I mean, the, the internet the internet is is like a phenomenal resource. Um, I think you know the governing body tries very hard to um, you know uh, have a have a certified pathway um but the the reality is i, th- I think my, my my big belief in coaching is is you have to practice it you have to learn you you have to learn on the floor so a, a big bugbear of mine is certification isn't an indoor it's sorry certification is only an endorsement to be healthy and safe on the floor in my opinion you know that, that you a level one a level two even a level three it's great. It, it says that you've accrued X amount of um, experience or maybe read so much and been able to deliver X, Y and Z in a, in, in, a, in a certain environment. But ultimately, coaching different age groups, uh, coaching both genders is important, um, coaching in different climates. You know, there's a big difference between inner city Birmingham, Manchester and London to the leafy lanes of other areas you know and beginning to understand the young people that come out of those areas and i i, I you know I, I you know i think it's important that you you test yourself you know and, and you and you parachute yourself into these different environments and understand what it means to forge a relationship with a player you understand what it means to forge a relationship with parents and coaches and partners and stakeholders and and I don't, I don't know. I, th- I think the, there's many blessings at the moment, but I also think um, perhaps there's a short. People think it's a a shorter route than it than, than it should be. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, like, it's the same thing. Mark Dunning always says about you know you've got to pay your dues. Like you've got to have done you know you've got to have done the experience. You've got to have done the sort of sitting on the end of the bench in the late nights as an assistant or, or whatever it might be before you can kind of take that head role. And there's I guess there's a maybe. I've heard people discuss it, talk about it in the same way they talk about young players. There's a level of entitlement or thinking that everyone wants everything now, rather than like you know actually to be a to be a head coach in any in a position of any type of uh, seniority within a program, you need to have put in a good decade beforehand. You know, it's not something you walk into, right? No, I, I agree. I think you serve your apprenticeship. You know, um, my old man's a a mechanic and and you know very 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 traditional trade, and I think. In any traditional trade, you you earn your time. You earn your time. Uh, you know you you learn the fundamental aspects of what of what your role and your job is, and and you practice it and you practice it and you practice it and you 
I mean, your aspiration is that you perfect it. I mean, but we we play in an un, <laughs> unperfect world, or an, or the game is imperfect in a, in a way. So, you know, I, I think I think it is important that they serve their time. But the, but by the, by by the same token, there needs to be the appropriate outlets for those young coaches to serve their time as well. And you know, if you if you look at the I guess I don't want to say, say it's attrition, but I guess the amount of coaches that get qualified and then the shelf life of, of those coaches, you know, some of that's by virtue of the fact that some of them want to be all rounders and they want, they want to coach in, in, in certain domains. But some of it is, I want to be a basketball coach, but where do I coach? You know, and you can only volunteer for so long. You know, how, how many positions are there? You in the, in the BBL, how many positions are there in Division One that are full time jobs? How many positions are there in academies? And I, I would suggest there's probably, you know, what hundred full time jobs. In a, and the population is sixty million. Is yeah. it sixty eight million? So you know, I, I I think that 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 is something that maybe as a sport. I don't know what the answer is necessarily, but we have to we have to try and address. There's got to there's got to be places for these young aspir- aspiring coaches to practice and practice at a level where where they're going to get a return from. Yeah, of course. It's a bit, you know, it's one thing sort of I don't know coaching an under fourteen team or whatever. But if you haven't got someone that's more senior to you working alongside you, giving you feedback, actually developing you, you know how much because otherwise you don't know what's right and what's wrong, right? Um, one of the other things that, that, that you, you actually briefly alluded to just then uh, in the question previous, uh, and I kind of noticed in um, some other interviews I read of you, is kind of there's a, I feel like you're very much aware of not just the X's and O's and that, that you know, basketball players are human beings, and really there's a, mass, a massive amount of coaching is, is man management, right? It's understanding kind of the needs and wants of individual players and how you can get the best out of them. Can you kind of, I guess, riff on that a little bit and talk about kind of how you approach uh, coaching when you're, when you're working with teams and players? I mean, relationships are everything, aren't they? You know, if, 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 if the players aren't going to go with you on that journey, then you've got a problem to start with, you know, and, you know, I'm not saying I'm I'm perfect because there's some relationships that have have not been good, you know, with players. But I think it's really really important to understand what their wants and needs are, um, help them understand the environment that you're trying to create, and and what part they can play in that, and um, ultimately create a level of trust, um, you know, between you and them. You know, they've got to know that that you've got their back, and I think sometimes and you certainly look at some of the individual journeys of some of our players um maybe they've you know as in gb players or domestic players sometimes they've fallen foul of an in- inconsistent approach or maybe the wrong environment and I, you know again i'm i'm not perfect I, you know you, you you learn about your environment you learn about yourself and you learn about the environments that you can um foster and develop but ultimately I think that's where I where, where, where I try to start and that starts on the first recruitment call you know it's the same it's, it's the same with, the, with 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 the imports as it is is with the players they've got to understand who I am and, and I guess what my aspirations are for for the program and and what their part will be in in that kind of season or or, or journey if you will I was going to say, when you're recruiting a player, even though talent-wise they're everything that you want and might fill the exact spot and, or needs that you have on your, on your roster, if you have those calls before before you bring them in and, and feel like for whatever reason there isn't that connection, they're not going to buy in, is that an instant no-no for you or is it something that you think, do you know what, I, I feel like I could work on it during the season and build that relationship so that he buys in? It's a, it's a good question. I think, I think I've got a reasonable feel for... Um, you know, players and, and, and their wants and needs. And, and, and uh, you know, you know what, there's, there's, there's too many guys in our fraternity that get a bad rap and, and, and I try and treat each one of them at face value. Does that make sense? So I'll always do due diligence and get in, get in contact with people and say, okay, what well, you know, what does this guy look like? You know, what, where, 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 where has he gone? You know, what has he done? And, and, and how has he, how has he benefited from um, the other environments that he's been in? And sometimes you'll get feedback where it's it's not particularly um, strong, you know. They'll say, "Oh, his character's flawed," or 
he's inconsistent in his attitudes and behaviors and then then you've got to ask yourself well what did you do to help his attitudes and behaviors be consistent what did you do to help him pull in the right direction or go in the right direction with with, with your your team your environment and that's that's kind of how i am you know i I, th- I think there's a few players that have played for me over the years where certain coaches have said, nah, you don't need this guy in your team. He's this and this. Well, where, when they when they came to us, there might have been a few hallmarks of, you know, a trouble character, disruptive soul or whatever, but maybe they just needed the right environment, you know? And, um, you know, I, I think I think there's some people that get that and there's some people that don't, you know, I there was a time probably where I was quite hard and fast and this is what I want and this is this is how it is and uh, if you don't conform to that then um you know you you you're not you're not a piece of the of the puzzle but ultimately I think helping somebody conform is, is is what you should do so if you've got if if you've got these aspirations for your club then you've got to give them a reason to conform to your ideology or your philosophy or whatnot so just jumping back to, to your timeline so you, whilst you're at university you know you had Preston Price set up uh, next club you're involved with York Vikings what was the situation there so I'd, I'd basically just come home so um, I'd, I'd, I'd moved back from college um, and uh, I'd come back to Harrogate and basically didn't have a coaching option and I knew I wanted to do it so I just basically reached out to the Leeds Tigers and the York Vikings and just got involved there for, for a couple of years, coached some junior national league, um, began to sort of accrue some more experience. And I, you know, I also set up um, my own company delivering basketball in primary schools because I, I didn't want to uh, work in bars or drive vans. So you were, was that your, you were full-time coaching from the moment that you left university or did you have a job as well? So basically, no, basically, I went back. I'd, I'd worked a lot of bars when I was at university to kind of pay my yeah. way. So I did some bar work and I drove some. Uh, I drove white vans. I was delivering furniture for half a year and and then doing the coaching. And like the furniture we were delivering all over the country, I was just like, this can't be. This can't be the future. So, um, sat down with one of the other coaches in in York, a guy called Paul Hartley, he's a very good friend of mine, and we just decided to set, to to try and make basketball work for us. So we ended up setting up a business that was coaching basketball in primary schools. We we brokered relationships with the school sports partnerships and we ended up delivering in all two hundred primary schools in Leeds for, for, for a period of time. That's a lot <laughs> that's a lot of primary schools. Yeah. How, like when you talk about implementing a you know a program of that scale, there's obviously a lot of hours across 200 schools. There's a lot of hours there to be coached. Like, kind of how, how does it actually work? The administration of it and running it and making it happen. And obviously, if there's only I don't know how many coaches you had, whether it was just you two kind of trying to run around and, and balance all of those. Like, how, how did it actually sort of work practically? That's how it started. <laughs> really, two guys having purchased a lot of basketballs and trying to accrue as many hours as possible, you know, four sessions a day, five days a week. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, in, in a way, it was another another lesson, you know. In, in, I mean, it, honestly, we started off, we wrote some ideas down on what a programme should look like for six weeks, 12 weeks and 18 weeks. And the school sports partnerships liked it. Basketball, I mean, it's a versatile sport, isn't it? You know, it, it lends itself to what primary physical education should be, you know, physical literacy, fundamental movement, um, kinesthetic awareness. So, you know, it, it, we, we, we were a little bit, um, uh, I guess, learning day to day, uh, but it was, it was good fun for a while, you know, and, 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 and I think the only mistake we made is we probably, when all the other vendors moved their, moved their prices up, we just, we just, just not, we're doing it for the love, you know what I mean? And then it was just like, hang on a minute. <laughs> um but yeah no good times and, and actually you know that that got me a job with um lead city council uh as well i, I kind of to, to just bolster things I, I ended up literally doing the same thing for lead city council we de- we'd got a few more coaches on board in terms of the company and we were just trying to get as much basketball going and that and that that job at the council was basically i got signposted to the job at leeds beckett from that was your, said, your job at the council was the official title, like sort of basketball development officer, like? 
it would have been it would have been um they had they had something called active sport and it it was an active sport basketball coach and then basically when Beckett, sorry, Leeds Metropolitan University were looking for a, a coach. My name just got thrown in the hat because it was meant to be a dual role, um, and it was a dual role for the first two, three years. Um, I would have been embedded in one of the SSPs, uh, and that's how the the, the, the youth program started because I was I wanted to, to build a club there, and I was based at the university. But we we kind of nailed our development plan in from 22 sorry 2006 to 2008 we got that got it all going so and then i've been full time at at leeds met and basically the guys that um the guys that had been employed by by the company we 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 kind of bought them in-house with with this with the ssp what year did you go full-time at the university a full-time was 2008 so okay two years later yeah so the that opportunity that first come up uh, with the university like, I guess from their side, why were they interested in building a basketball program? Like, what was their motivation? Um, and I guess from your side, going into it, like, did you see that as an opportunity to really build a program from the bottom up and build kind of a thing ultimately to the be- Like, what were the initial aspirations? I mean, I, I wanted to go all the way with it. So, you know, I, that, that, was, that was it. You know, there was a few programs that were already on that track or had been on that track Worcester was at, obviously ahead at that time um, and and really making inroads in, in terms of uh, their ascension in the National League and it was just a really exciting proposition the, the institution at the time was buzzing um, uh, there was a very very forward-thinking uh, vice chancellor um, in, in terms of I felt he understood that the if you found your niche you know in terms of the higher education sector sport being the niche in, in this instance then then you you can catapult the identity of the uh, of the institution and i guess his background he he'd been out in the states so sport was a big vehicle for him um so it wasn't just basketball um you know i was appointed in 2006 uh with uh full-time rugby union and rugby league coaches already in place full-time football coach being in place and then the subsequent year after i was employed they went with a volleyball coach a netball coach and a hockey coach so sport sport was massive and and i have to say that that was a that was a big a big one for me i mean in my office i so i shared an office with other coaches i had the all-time winningest uh, student rugby league coach I had Jack Maitland, who was the Brownlees triathlon coach. I had a former British Lion in Colin Stevens. You know, there was all these guys. John Hall, who was an ex- exceptional um, coach educator for, for the FA, but was the football coach. And uh, Graham Potter actually ended up in that office, who obviously coaches in the Premiership now. So there was there was all these coaches going, well, through a similar journey to me, but some had already accrued a great deal of experience or some had some were just accruing the experience. So there was this little melting pot of, I wouldn't say it was coaching excellence, but it was a thriving coaching community. You know what I mean? Because some of us were aspiring to achieve excellence. We, you can't knock, you know, uh, Jack Maitland, he's, he, he's producing gold medalists. <laughs> so, you, you know, there was just this, 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 this really nice vibe, you know. Why does why does a university look at sport and say we want to become you know the leading sporting institution in the country? Like, is it about the visibility that it gets you, and then potential recruitment of not just domestic students but international students um, to essentially be a revenue generator? Like, what is the you know when I look at the U.S. college system, there's clear incentive there because obviously college athletics is worth so much money to the to the program. Obviously, in the U.K., it's a very very different scenario because there isn't the endorsement deals in the same way there isn't the the the, the gate receipt in the same way um but like, what is the incentive from a university side to become a leading sporting institution I, th- I think it's it's it helps grow their identity you know you know at the time you know Le- leeds metropolitan university isn't a russell group school okay you know it was renowned for academia but its history was in physical education and sport and therefore, why not align your identity with with that aspect? And you know, the the Carnegie brand became uh, strong again. Now, some people might not have liked that internally or otherwise, but my my belief is is all institutions 
require unique selling points. You know, Worcester itself, for example, where I am now, the University of Worcester is a sport is embedded in the fabric of of the institution. Basketball is embedded in the fabric of the institution. Hence the reason they've got a, you know, a 2000 seat arena. You know, it, it, I, I don't think it's wrong if it's done in, done in the right way. Um, and uh, I think universities should be the beneficiary of a sporting identity. Yes, there isn't the TV revenue that you would get uh, in, in the US, but it's it's healthy for that institution and its community to, to be involved in sport, in my, in my opinion. So when you mapped out kind of your plan for that program, um, you know, you, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I assume that you, you were pretty much in control of everything, like in terms of the direction of the program, who you're going to bring in, how you're going to build it out. Kind of that, that, I guess the 2006, so the first time the job opportunity came up, kind of what was that initial plan? What was the plan that you put together? Like what were the timelines in terms of what you're actually trying to achieve? I mean, to attract domestic recruits, you had to, my, my feeling was you would have to have a Division One or a BBL franchise essentially because you know division four division three might not be attractive for for a certain level of player does that make sense so it was really important for me to ascend through the ranks uh as as quickly as possible and and we were fortunate we had a nice um a nice situation in terms of the what there was scholarships available and we could attract a, a certain level of player or indeed international players um Obviously, in the early years, we had a domestic cohort that was complemented by either several Americans or we had a Hungarian contingent, which uh, Coach Nemeth helped us develop a relationship in in, in Hungary. Um, and we, we kind of were the beneficiary of that. Um, but it really was to, to try and get to a point where we could be a destination for British talent. That, 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 that was kind of the aspiration, you know. Um, Ultimately, did we get there? I think we were close to it. I think we were close to it. If you look at the the, la- the later stages of, of, of the program, um, when there was the likes of Henry Wilkins, Sean Clifford, Jack Stannard there, you know, there was guys that had made a conscious decision to come to Leeds for basketball and, um, and uh, get their education. So that... Uh... What's mad is that, so when I look through kind of the, the years, so it was 2006-2007 uh, was, was the first season uh, in division, when you're talking about National League. Obviously, Division 4, uh, you win it, uh, win National Shield as well. 2007-2008, Division 3, you win it. 2008-2009, um, Division 2, uh, you win it. And then obviously you end up in Division 1, uh, have success there. Um, ultimately ended up winning the National Club play- Playoff title a couple of years later. So you, you literally did the entire progression uh, in a relatively short period of time as well. When you talk about the res- like what a tr- like what allowed that to happen, you know, there are plenty of clubs that come in at Division Four and say, "Oh, I want to be in Division One within you know four years or whatever, three years, and 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 sort of um, get earn promotion every single year and have that success." Like, what was the the situation in Leeds that allowed that to happen? Like, how much res- resource was the university putting in? You know, when you talk about sort of the backing of the club, uh, where was that coming from? Yeah, I mean. It's the same as a number of, of, of programs that, that have, have probably evolved uh, over time in, within institutions. First and foremost, access to space. Yeah. Before you start, you know, budget, you know, being on the court four, four times to five times a week with individual practices in the morning at seven in the morning and access to a weight room and access to the pool and access to physiotherapy. That's probably the fundamentally the platform that you need then you can, it always comes down to facility facility is just so huge right yeah i mean that, that 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 was one thing that was was so important and and then the staff the human resource yeah and then after that obviously the the scholarships and you know the the, the scholarships were were um disparate you know they weren't all full rides People sometimes said that, oh, he's got 10 full rides. No, we didn't have 10 full rides. We, we had <laughs> X amount of full rides that might have been divvied up, for example. You know, we, 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 we were fortunate in a number of ways, and I, I don't ever doubt that. But the, the um, sports development manager we had at the time was very, very forward thinking. His name was Ian Smythe, and 
he he wanted sport to succeed and and he understood what a student athlete requires to excel they don't need financial pressure they need to eat and they need a bed that's it <laughs> right okay and if you create x amount of those situations those sportsmen or women will achieve a lot more than less you know that, that that's the reality of the situation so so we had x amount of scholarships i think at our height we probably had six to eight i think wow which which which, which was good but again they were they were to di- different levels and that obviously it's a choice of an institution to um to back you on that but the power is with the institution they have housing they have the ability to issue a waiver for fees and they have the ability to for example in some institutions you might have a food card does that does that mean they, yeah. they have they have that and most institutions have that so it's, it's whether or not it's whether or not sport is is important enough for an institution to create that budget line and and, and make it happen but i stand by what i said you know i they, they had a full-time coach they had the facilities full-time snc full-time physio yeah the thing that that um you know that question about whether or not the institution and it might not just be obviously university you know i could i could Academy of basketball has grown massively. and It's a double-edged sword in the sense of, yes, if you can forge that partnership, you get access to all this resource, but it also means on a level that you're kind of at their mercy. And if they decide one year whether there's a change in chancellor or whatever and they don't want it to, to make it a priority anymore, all of a sudden you can be completely left in the dark, just like what happened with Northumbria in Division 1, uh, which we saw what was last year, year before last. Um, h- how do you balance that? And I guess how can you make sure if you're, if you're setting up a club that you're not at the mercy of a sole, uh, just one sole sort of resource backer, whatever you want to call it, that if they do pull the plug, you know, you're in a position where you've got to pick up the pieces and you don't, you know, ideally you'd have multiple revenue streams. So if one leaves, you're actually in a situation where you can kind of uh, balance off uh, that one with the others. I think, I think um, the, the, the idea of, of a, a club and an institution having synergies is important, but I, I think you've got to get to a point where you, can work independently should should that eventuality occur does that does that make sense and i think i think you know it's, it's happened to a sorry it has happened at a number of places and unfortunately you are at the mercy of a maybe a four or an eight year tenure from senior leadership um unless you've created such a um model where it is embedded within the fabric of the institution so whether it is sport or whether it is one sport or only four sports um i think it's important you know i i I think for basketball it would be ideal to have eight to ten institutions in this country which which it was the case consistently and maybe that needs um higher level work done between governing body, GB basketball, or otherwise, to create these situations where there's parity across the piece. You know, the, each institution has five scholarships a year. Each institution does provide this, and I, I know I, I'm, I'm conscious that some people have been working towards that. But you know yourself, you've covered it for so many years. Um, a number of institutions have have, have risen and fallen um, on the on the back of um, that model. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. I mean, you probably don't even remember this, actually, but uh, I've actually played against your teams, uh, Final Eights. Um, so I was at Brunel uh, from 2005 to 2008, which was literally just when your program was coming up. And I remember the Final Eights, uh, just like, obviously, Leeds had come out of nowhere. Like, you know, it was like there had been no talk of a basketball program. Uh, in the, I'm talking about on the university stage. And this, at this point, it was Booster, wasn't it, before it was Bucks. Um There'd be no talk about, about you know, at least basketball, and they're just out of nowhere. I remember, like, uh, and you know, I was only 19, 20, I can't even remember, but um, the professionalism that you guys had, the aura that your program had, but you know, we didn't have any scholarships, like, we were all just the students that liked playing basketball, if you know what I mean. Um, 
and so the comparison between i guess what what we had access to and kind of what what you guys were doing and just the 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 way that you know you were suit and tie you know all top to bottom branded up with the green uh the green tie obviously your program you had warm-ups just everything about it you, you your support staff on the bench was just uh was crazy like when you look about when you look at sort of i guess university basketball boost of the environment uh and, and in bucks which i think it changed whilst I, I think it was in my final year that it ended up changing it was around 2008 2009 that it turned turned to buck they rebranded to bucks when you talk about the environment back then um compared to now like how much do you think it has evolved if at all I, f- I feel like back then there were actually probably more scholarships floating around than there actually are now and there were more programs that were trying to really do the basketball thing where now i feel like that 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 number has really uh, shrunk um but yeah, like kind of how would you compare like the, the sort of the two eras and how it's evolved over the last, I guess, sort of decade um, that you've been involved? I mean, it's an interesting one for me because I, I probably I think we were involved in I don't want to call it a heyday, but the, I, I feel that the, the final eights and, you know, you've got a lot of coverage of it. There was a point at which there was Durham, ourselves, Worcester, obviously, were, were legit. Yeah, like. <laughs> it's just one, a... one through ten. Um, uh, um, South Bank. Yeah, South Bank, and then then just just before that era, Marjons were the, like the dynasty, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. They 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 they, they just kind of peed out, and and so has it got better? I'm not convinced it has, honestly. But but I'm I may be I may be doing it a disservice, but I've watched some of the books games. Love obviously very very good at this moment in time um you know there's there's a couple of the 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 london universities by virtue of either relationship with lions for example or that have, have, have still got guys uh, guys around but i i, I think it was there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of good things happening in multiple places at the same time which meant that when that final eight weekend went off it was you know, I mean, there was one point where Worcester had their BBL guys, which which were, you know, like Hayes and Life, unbelievable, like Stan Lassetti, people like that. Uh, we were in Division One. Uh, Andy Powsland was 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 doing good things down at South Bank and 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 had the Brixton Top Cats tie in it. And there was just a vibe, and there was I, I, there was almost a camaraderie, I think. Um, you know, everybody felt it was it was moving in the right direction. Your coverage had, had helped amplify things as well. And um, some people may may disagree with this, but I think the National League was a beneficiary of it because there was teams of a certain level consistently going to going to war on each other. And people will always maybe um, criticise the institutions for for. For being at a certain level at that uh, at that time, but for me, it made Division One healthy. You know, um, it, it, there was some good there was some good rivalries. You know, there was some really good talent, and I think everybody was was stepping up to the mark. You know, and and there was there was a lot of a lot of battles. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, on the, f- the flip side of that, it's like, yeah, it, it does provide a, a level of stability. But as we've already discussed at the moment, that plug is pulled. You've got programs that have been powerhouses for a number of years and they just suddenly just, just completely, uh, you know, petter out. How much of an opportunity do you think um, Bucks Basketball has to contribute to sort of growing the game here? Like, I, I, like you were saying, I do feel like there is a complete disconnect between Bucks the federations, the pro league, like it's all very much run in isolation. When actually, if there was a way of bringing it all together, and there was talk of uh, there was talk of a Buck Super League for a while, right? That that kind of never ended up happening for for whatever reason. Um, that if it was all aligned, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you can actually provide credible options for kids rather than going to the states. Well, actually, you know, you can get a free year scholarship here, potentially have your tuition covered, and get opportunities in the BBL or national league or whatever, and and be in a situation where you don't have to leave home and and uh, and this could run. But obviously, that kind of hasn't worked out so far. Like, what would you say about that as an opportunity? Do you think it's some something that is, um, I guess, maybe being overlooked up until this point? I don't, I don't think it's been overlooked. I know the governing body has looked at it. Um, I know GB Basketball looked at it. Um, I know some, ser- you know, some seriously influential people within our fraternity want to endorse it. But I, I think it's how do you alignment's not an easy thing with so many moving parts. And I think if you were to create a 
university league or, or whatnot, you, you know, you, what you don't want to do is displace Division One clubs that have been there forever and a day that have, have worked very, very hard to forge an identity, develop players and so forth. So the, there's, a, there's a lot of things that you've got to consider. I think it could, it could be part of the solution, but, but it needs to be aligned with the overall pathway. And, 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 and again, I know the governing bodies um, try to at least enter that conversation and, 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 and put certain pieces in place. The EABL was, uh, was very strong for a period, but potentially is, is dominated by, by, by a few at this moment in time. Um, connecting the knots won't, won't be easy, but I, th- I think it's part of the solution, but you need a consistent offer. So, when player X, who won't be in the top tier, the top tier are likely to go east or west. If we're really honest about it, at this moment in time, uh, they are. They are. There's a difference between the three hundred thousand dollar education, the high level environment that uh, an ACC school or any Division One school would offer, um, or Division Two school potentially would offer. So. Um, and there's a difference between um, a young man going to or a young woman going out to Spain. And, and, and into into a a Euro Cup Euro League environment or an ACB environment, you know. And so, where where we have to work, well, what we have to work towards, I believe, is a and it is aspirational. You know, it's not easy, but like say eight to ten uh, places where there's a consistent offer. So a hundred, you know, a hundred male and a hundred females get to compete at a high level with the the best level of support they can you know yeah no t- totally so talking about consistency you know with the with your with your your national league program with uh, leeds kind of you had done it all um you know you're winning at every level you've worked your way up into division one and of course you know the next stage is is the bbl like how did that opportunity first arise um Kind of, what were your approach going into it? Uh, I guess, how did it come to fruition? So, we we at the time we 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 made an expression of interest. The BBL were obviously interested interested because they'd followed followed the journey um, a, a little bit, and the proposition at the time from on our part was a good proposition. You know, we were coming in um, as an institutionally based program. With a certain level of support, and um, we put our proposal on the table, and and it looked good, um, and uh, we basically had it accepted, and then pretty much in May June time, um, not a lot of people really know how this played out, but we we unfortunately lost the backing of the institution in principle, so um, there was still an appetite for for student players to be the beneficiary of that experience but um you know across the piece the level of support for support had had been reduced in certain areas and and unfortunately um we were we weren't going to be going to uh to uh the league with what we thought we would be going to and um myself and some other interested parties decided to try and do it without uh, that level of support because that was the, the the situation right was that you your application had been accepted the year before uh so you had a sort of season and a half i guess to to kind of prepare and then you know three weeks well not three weeks a few weeks i think it was a few weeks maybe a couple of months before before the start of the season you know essentially the university pulls the plug what was the university's reasoning behind uh you know not wanting to be involved when i assume you know that had been part of the discussion in the previous eight years prior you know it was always about reaching the top flight i, th- I think uh, the identity of the institution was changing um there was a new vice chancellor um sport across the piece uh, needed to be more diverse um and perhaps performance wasn't or was becoming less of a priority and um, you know that that's that's the reality of the situation uh, and that was a hard one to take you know it, it was you know, uh, a, a, a tough one to kind of rationalise, but ultimately, like in any business, you, you people have to make decisions. So uh, this decision had been made, and it and it and it wasn't um, it wasn't something that they wanted to to go forward with. Although they were willing to support in other ways, you know, it, it's not like 
they completely pulled the plug. Uh, you know, there was there was still access um, to the facility. Um, there was still a level of support in terms of SNC and so forth. And you know, the people on the ground were still as friendly as ever. Does that make sense? So you know, there the, the, the was still there was still a little bit of uh, of support there in a way. And then when it came to the decision uh, between you and others to, I guess, essentially try to do it yourselves um, or without that, that level of backing that you originally thought that you were going to have, what made you decide to still go forward with it uh, rather than just say, do you know what, like, this is just, uh, this makes this situation 10 times more complicated. It's just not worth the hassle right now. We need to go back to the drawing board and kind of reassess um, what we need to do to be able to sort of go in and, and and with the same amount of resource that you originally had intended uh, to go in with? I mean, I, I can't speak for the others, but obviously it'd been a, it'd kind of been a massive part of my life. And I, I, in my mind, I couldn't deal with it just stopping. Does that, does that make sense? Maybe, maybe the sensible thing probably would have been to step back and, and reevaluate and, 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 and maybe, process how it could be done in a different way but sometimes pride just takes over you know and for me that was it was almost like I'm going to do this you know what irrespective of it I'm going to do it um you know again reflect on it that was going to be a you know a 36 month period that was going to be probably the toughest of my career so if you were to go back and give yourself advice now uh, to that period would you uh, advise yourself not to do it I honestly can't answer that I, ca- I can't answer that because I'm a different guy now you know and uh, at, at the time like I say pride pride appetite whatever you say you know I, I, I was adamant that I was doing it and I'm a pretty stubborn human when when I've got an idea in my mind or uh, you know and and in fairness, there was there was there was a, a few people, really really good people, that just said, "You this could cost you," you know, and you know, I, I just think I think we were trying to prove a point, um, and and there was a, a lot of fight to try and get it done, and you know, actually, the second season we made the playoffs, and 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 it looked like we could we could we could do do more, but it, you know, I think. The process was 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 exhausting in a lot of ways. I mean, not, go on, sorry. Not just you know, not just not just from a a personal perspective, but you know, the everybody everybody was was giving everything. The players, you know, the the people around me, the support mechanism, the family. You know, it was it was it was tough. I think even even that first season, like you picked up nine wins, which I think compared to you know some other franchises that have tried to enter the league and, and do it was was relatively respectable. Do you know what I mean? Like, do you do you feel like uh, you competed better than you had expected in, in that that initial season? I, in in a way, I'm not being I'm not being funny. I wasn't really frightened of the basketball, so you know you know the the, the basketball was probably the easiest easiest bit, and and that's not being being arrogant because I had really good people around me. You know, I had had uh, two assistant coaches, you know, uh, Samit Narazade was with me, who, who who had competed against at Reading, who I I trust, you know, implicitly. I had um, an academic from uh, Leeds Beckett called Bob Muir, uh, who's who's pretty much one of the the people in in coaching and was a uh, you know a really good sounding ball for years. So, in terms of the basketball element, that that was that was like the easiest piece of the puzzle. It was kind of managing everything. That was going on around to, to to try and make it work, to try and be competitive, because um, being competitive isn't just about how you prepare a team or the personnel you recruit. Although talent is obviously very very important, it's about how organised you are in every aspect, and that's what makes Newcastle the giant that it is. That's what makes Leicester the giant that it is. You know, and Paul and Russell respectively. You know, they're the, two of the hardest working humans I've ever met in my life, you know, and, and you need to be in that mold, you know, and I think, uh, again, people don't understand what the working week looks like for those, those people, you know, and, and for me, it it was a similar thing, you know, I, I, I was, I was doing a lot to make it work as were other people, as were other people. 
When you speak about kind of, yeah, you know, the on-court things essentially were kind of, you weren't as worried about. It was all the other stuff. What was all the other stuff? When you're talking about the comparison between running a successful Division One program and then uh, trying to make a BBL franchise work, like what are the biggest uh, contrasts between the two? What were the biggest uh, parts of your own learning curve um, that you kind of had to get ironed out to try and uh, ensure that the franchise could, could work? It's just obviously making sure that the the player environment off the court's right, you know, ensuring that you're driving some sort of fan base. And, and in fairness, there's a few people working very, very hard to to try and do that. Um, I think some of the decisions that were made in terms of how we would do it um, maybe impeded uh, us a little bit. But I mean, the stands were the stands were filling up, but you know, you you're filling up a, a venue that you know has the capacity of you know 550 to 700 as opposed to Elsewhere, there's obviously only so much return you can get on that. And, um, you know, there, there was just, you know, simply put, um, we, we needed more human resource. And again, that's, for me, the significant difference between those that have survived and those that, that, that haven't is they've, they've built an on-court identity. They've built um, an off-court infrastructure that, that, can um, manage the load and they've developed consistently developed human resource to underpin that do you think the bbl franchise committee should have actually uh not let you in i don't think that's a fair question uh because the bbl committee were actually really really supportive at the time and 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 ultimately the proposition that we were were, were putting forth we we believed in at the time you know and and i think it's all right people saying did they show due diligence yes they showed due, due diligence we 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 tried to, we tried to push through and and ultimately for a number of reasons it it, it, it kind of fell short making the playoffs that that uh that second season you know how big uh was that for you um you know how how much did it mean for the franchise obviously going from kind of day, day one building from the bottom and coming all the way up to now you know you not only got a bbl franchise but but you made the playoffs or was it a case of everything that was going off on the court made the whole thing so stressful that you weren't even really able to enjoy it like maybe you should have no it, it was a massive deal. and from a from a basketball perspective it was a massive deal because you know we'd 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 put a run together at the, at the end of that season which i believe finished with us Oh. Um, oh, sorry about this, Sam. <laughs> it's all right. Lights out. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Embarrassing. Um, so um, basically, um, yeah, that run, that the run at the end of that season, we were we were flowing, and we, I think uh, we matched up with Leicester to to take to give us our playoff position. And the Leicester franchise is like you know it's right there, and you know. I think I'm a big believer in whatever life you lead, you you, you should be chasing somebody and, you know, that program and coach Pat Nostro and the success that they had to just just to to get that 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 game over the line, that win and the significance it had. That that was a personally a big moment for me as a coach. Um uh, I think we we did enjoy it. We had to turn it we, we had to turn around very, very quickly and we had Leicester obviously in the in, in the playoffs. <laughs> So um, we prepared pretty well again, and and actually the first game at home was close, but um, physically we were we were finished for the for the for the for the return leg, and you know one of the lessons there, you know, for the for the BBL is is the the clubs that are really are successful is they their their model gives them the opportunity to recruit depth and and. Rob was really smart that first night. Rotated very, very well. kept 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 uh, kept the lead. kept it going. Was happy with the close game and you know punished us physically. And then obviously the next night we we, we didn't have the the legs for it. Comparatively, when you talk about the the resource that your franchise had in comparison to other other franchises in the league, when you're talking about playing budget and everything else, like how did it compare? You know, was it um was it a situation where you were very much uh, under budget compared to other teams? <laughs> So, my understanding in terms of budgets, we we were we were running at probably, I would say, between fifteen and twenty percent of the top teams' budgets. Wow. 
may, maybe even a bit less. And without some of the ancillary support, you know, in terms of aspects in housing and so forth. So, yeah, it worked. You know, the, those guys that, you know, that, that played for us those years, they 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 were very loyal. Um, you know, they took a low check for the opportunity, I would suggest. Um, and, um, you know, really, really gave everything, you know. Was it after that playoff season that you ended up departing? Or did you have one no, more year? I did. I did one more year. Uh, but unfortunately, for different reasons... The, the budget reduced again, um, so we still we still clocked um, a number of wins. I, I think from a performance perspective, we did pretty well. We Especially pretty when you consider your budget in comparison to everybody else's. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and we brought in a few players that other teams obviously uh, took uh, took the subsequent year as well, which was which was nice. You know, I think it's a nice endorsement when you can give a player an opportunity and then they can continue in, the, in their professional career. But I think, um, unfortunately, behind the scenes, myself and the, and the other directors had got to the point where it was untenable, uh, the relationship, and, and, and really some things went down that were, that were pretty tough to swallow. And uh, we, we, we parted company. Obviously, when when a, when a team franchise wants to get set up, you know you've got a board of directors. You've got a, normally there's n more than one person involved. There's a number of different people. When you talk about the learnings from that, if if another person was setting up a franchise, like the things that become un untenable, was it a case of personalities clashing and you just had different ideas of the direction, or was it other things like I guess what are the takeaways from it that other people can apply to their own experiences when they're you know potentially looking at setting up a club? Uh, I just think the Philosophically, ideologically, we were from sorry. Philosophical perspective, uh, we were we weren't in the same place. There was some significant challenges in terms of administration, financial, and, and, and otherwise. Um, the way that it had played out, and the way that certain things had been navigated, were. In, in my opinion, not good, and um, I was left with no choice. I, I didn't have a say really in the matter, unfortunately. And and I think you you, you always need the right people around you in in, in business and in life. Um, you always need uh, consistency in your approach, and and you you need to be aligned in your ideas and your philosophy. And and and, and there's got to be high order skill sets. Now, like, you know, you you look at the people that are at the top right now; they've got high order skill sets across several areas to make make things happen. And you need three or four of those bodies to 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 be sustainable. On top of other things, how you know? I know this is obviously a difficult thing to talk about, uh, but you know, I I, th I think about it in in my situation. If if I had built a program from the bottom up been there with it for however many years over a decade ish um done taking it from the bottom to the bbl and then ultimately having to depart you know how much of a difficult pill was that to swallow for you um essentially walking away from you know the baby that you'd help uh, you'd help um raise i don't you know um it's, it's probably hard to articulate but it was it was a very painful um B, I, I felt helpless, uh, and and C, and I think it's kind of a natural thing. I was embarrassed, you know, uh, in in a, in a way. And those are those are difficult feelings to uh, negotiate, you know. And for for a good period of time, I was in in a bad way, uh, you know. Um, but fortunately, I I kind of reinvested my time and energies in in a in a in a great group of young people um within the academy I, I tried to do more on the on, on the floor in the community just to kind of almost um take my mind away from from you know what was quite a big circle of doubt you know trying to contemplate why things have happened why why i'm in this position what 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 does the what next look like you know because <laughs> this is all i've known um and um yeah, it was rough and then you know 
people people would would be calling me saying, oh, they're not doing well without you and so forth. And you know, irrespective of how things played out, I never wanted to see you know the franchise die. And that was that that was very. It was almost like a double-edged sword. You know, you, you first and foremost, you know, I'm I'm not part of it, and secondly, it's it's done. You know, it's finished. You know, and ir- irrespective of like say how it played out and whatever happened on a you know a on a business level, um, it it was tough. Right, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I can't even imagine. Well, when um, so the, they basically did the the franchise did another year uh, in the, in the league after after you left, which I'm they didn't pick up a win. Did they not pick up a win? I think that it was a pretty bad season. Um, and kind of everyone was saying that you know they need to be kicked out. Like, and of course, ultimately that's what happened. When when the franchise ended up being stopped, was there any part of you that thought I'm going to do this again? <laughs> I'm going to try and you know have another have another crack at this start start again and, and try and get a franchise BBL franchise in Leeds. I don't think I would have been ready. Um, you know, uh, Leeds is a great city. Um, I think there is a place for it uh, on on the professional landscape down the line. Uh, but at, at the time, um, like say, I was I, I was in a pretty bad bad spot and just needed to I needed to coach and and just find um, a little bit of a little bit of love for the situation again. Does that make sense? And it didn't really matter if it was, you know, a primary school session or a, <laughs> or a, an academy session. I just, I just needed to coach. And actually, you know, the, the Leeds Beckett teams of that, of those two years weren't, they weren't particularly good, but those kids worked really hard for me. So I, you know, it, there was, there was still something, something there. And, uh, and that got me through. So, Wow. So that 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 two years out, you were essentially doing community coaching. Was, was, was this with City of City of Leeds Basketball Club as your club at that point? Uh, I, I, I still had um, I still had my role at, at, the, at Leeds Beckett, so I was okay. still filling that role. Um, but that was that was a part time role, and I was coaching the the academy uh, as well, and uh, just helping out with the foundation aspects. So on a Saturday with the minis, or if a school session needed covering, just just taking the time out and going and delivering or alternatively just um you know maybe working with players on an individual basis just it it was just whatever it whatever it could be really (laughs) i think i it it just need i just needed it really and when you saw that 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 worcester position first advertised kind of what, what were your thoughts um did you feel like you'd had that sort of time to kind of reset and 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 now was the time to to get back involved at the top flight it was a it was a bit of a last last minute decision. Um, I'd seen some other positions come up. I'd been contacted from uh, a couple of um, agents in Europe just to see if, if if my my interest was elsewhere, and I was really nervous, honestly, really nervous about it. Um, and it was a big decision for me personally, for the family, um, but it just it it felt right to go again just felt right i you know and i guarantee this i probably haven't been too nervous uh in 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 a lot of situations but when i interviewed i was i was incredibly nervous and uh, fortunately they they liked the presentation and and where i was coming from in terms of philosophically and i'm very very privileged that um uh, the management gave me the opportunity when you talk about stability of coaching roles, you know, originally it was it was a one year deal, right, which was then then renewed again, you know, for this season. Uh, you know, is is that a challenge? Like, I guess for you, fa- you know, having family and everything else, like, not knowing necessarily that you're locked in long term, um, and you don't know sort of when this journey is going to end. I, I think I think it's tough for uh, for all parties in in professional sport, but ultimately we're in professional sport, you know, and. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of Eastern European friends, and they say just always have your bag packed, because <laughs> that's how they see it. You know, I mean, I'd like to think uh, this this tenure will will be long term, but I'm realistic, and I've got to make sure that um, we're consistent in our performance and and we win games. And you know, I I, I under, understand that I've got another remit here. I've I've got to help drive other aspects and and develop other aspects of of the program, 
uh, for the Wolves as well. So hopefully if I do my job and do it the right way, then um, we'll be in a good position in the future. So just before we wrap up, just some, some quick fire questions uh, to throw your way. Um, something I always like asking about is, is top junior British players that, that coaches, players have seen. So I'd love to kind of hear who's your pick for the top uh, British junior player that you've ever seen. Ever? Ever seen, yeah. That, that doesn't, doesn't matter what they did at a senior level, at a junior level. That is that is really tough. Um, I, I I don't think I can I don't think I can limit it to one. Yeah. But I thought um, Devon Venustrom uh, as a as a youth was up there. Um, Ryan, obviously Ryan Richards. Um, you know, unbelievable for for age and stage. If 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 you think about it, um, not because he started with me, but Ben Eves was very very good as a, as a youth player. I'll probably give you two more then. I've not made <laughs> if that's all right. Um, I really like Cameron Hildreth. I really, I think he's 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 big time. Um, and um, one more. This is this you've you've killed me, but um, of a generation. I, you know what I really like I really like Miles Hessen because he was uh, a, a, and as a youth maybe not, but he's just evolved incredibly as a player, um, incredibly as a player. Yeah, I remember him being out with us in the uh, World Championship three on three, and I, he kind of blew up out of that, and you know the rest is history. So. Who's the favourite player you've coached? <laughs> you can give me a couple names. Not five, but a couple. A couple? Oh, my gosh. Um, the personality or talent? Because there's, we've, we've had some big personality there. Both. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, both, really. Like if, you, if, you were, if you were picking an all-time team of players that you've coached, like who would be your first pick? First pick? Yeah. Honestly, uh, probably from Division One, uh, Albert, my guy. And we, there's been some guys that people argue were more talented and all that, but he, he was the epitome of toughness in my my opinion. Never, never, never disrespectful. Always, hundred percent all in, and. More importantly, held other people to account. But you know, he 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 was probably the one. And, and you know, like I'd say, our teams have had all all sorts of players, but I think he he's he's the one. In to, in terms of your own personal um, coaching inspirations, role models, uh, who are they? So oh, that's it. That's a tough one. Um, I I kind of obviously in my youth I. I a lot of the flavor came from from looking looking um, to the U.S. and and, and to the West, and I, th- I think I, you know, Bob Knight I, it was was a big big one for me, just in terms of um, standards and 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 ha- how he won and how he prepared teams and so forth. Uh, there's a high school coach in the U.S. called Bob Hurley. I worked his camp um, when I was younger, and he was a big inspiration to me because he was just such a humble man you know yeah really really again standards driven he, and, and he did so much for young people he provided so many young men with the opportunity to um you know leave new work and, and go on to bigger and better things whilst winning so many accolades at high school and probably after that um yeah you know what I, i'm gonna i'm gonna flip this when I was growing up in, in Division One as a coach, that fraternity of coaches are probably the guys that have had the most impact. So the likes of Chris Meller, uh, Matt Shaw, um, Samit Narizade, those guys that were coaching Div- Division One, Mark Stewart, because we were all going in the sim- in a similar direction and and learning as as we went and and actually learning from one another, and so. I think that group of peers, where 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 I didn't have a peerage when I was younger as a coach, there was suddenly a there was suddenly a group of guys that 
they were getting after it. They were coaching, like they were really, really coaching. And, you know, on any given night, you could have a chat after the game and whoever kicked each other's ass, you know, the, you, you got, you got real time feedback on it. I was like, you know, down in Reading, we're up eight, we lose by four. It shouldn't have happened. And you're asking why rather than being salty about it. Does it, does it, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Uh, so that there, yeah, I'm sorry for flipping it, but I just, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, uh, go, sorry, go on. And yeah, your favorite basketball memory. Favorite basketball memory. Um, probably the Division One playoff title. I think um, because it was kind of the end point of that part of my career. Does that make sense? Yeah. I remember bawling my eyes out afterwards. But, um, yeah, that, I think that, that as a basketball memory, that that's that's the one that probably sticks sticks there. And then looking to the to the future, uh, three to five years, you know, where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? It's a big question right now because obviously um, we've got to come out of what is an extraordinary year and 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 obviously try to come out on top, <laughs> which is which won't be easy. But um, I'd like to think that my, my tenure at Worcester will continue. Uh, we'll be able to be a, a perennial contender in the mould of Leicester in Newcastle and uh, potentially, you know, have the opportunity to to take this program further. You know, if there's the position, appetite and desire to do so, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to be at the helm of a domestic franchise that, that takes the European step or alternatively, you know, if, if I've done all I can do, then have one opportunity where, you know, it's abroad and it's on the line and, you know, there's, there's, there's just the, uh, the next level, if that makes sense, if it's possible, you know, I've, I've, I've got to work hard to get there. You know, I'm not, I'm not the finished article yet. You know, I'm, I've still got a lot to learn, so we'll see. It's a perfect place to leave it, Matt. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. Obviously, good luck uh, with the season. Big game uh, tomorrow night. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm sure we will uh, see each other on the circuit at some point soon. Thank you very much. 